repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766 only temporarily uh, resolved conf conflict between the British government and the colonies. But the British government was still in a pickle. Uh, King George III and his ministers, they still needed revenue, and they believed that, that the American colonists ought to help shoulder the burden of paying for their defense and paying off Great Britain's debts. Between 1767 and 1772, the royal government carried out a series of policies designed to increase revenues from the colonies, and these policies really upset the colonists because the colonists believed that these policies were a threat to their self-government and even threatened their rights or violated their rights as English subjects. The, the protests of the colonists uh, were sometimes violent, and the Sons of Liberty played a key role in many of these protests. The, the British government often responded to these protests in a forceful manner, and the, these reactions by the British government always tended to increase and escalate tension between the American colonists and the British government over this period. So what we're going to do, do today is so we're going to examine a number of things. First of all, we're going to look at the policies of the minister, Charles Townsend, and his efforts to raise revenue in 1767. We're going to look at the, the Boston riot of 1768 that concerned the ship known as the Liberty. Uh, we're going to look at the, the Boston massacre in 1770. And finally, we're going to look at the burning of the British ship Gaspé in 1772. Let's begin by looking at the Townsend, Charles Townsend. Charles Townsend was the Chancellor of the, Ex of the Exchequer, or the Treasury, and uh, he was charged by King George III to raise revenues from the colonies. And uh, these policies pursued by T Townsend became known collectively as the Townsend Acts. Now, the first uh, act was Townsend got Parliament to pass the Revenue Act of 1767. Now, what, what this act did was to raise new customs duties on new products, imported glass, paint, paper, and tea. Now, to make sure that these duties were collected in a, an effective manner, uh, Townsend created a whole new bureaucracy. He, he created an American Board of Customs to oversee the collection of customs duties, and this American Board of Customs was under the direction of a Secretary of State for American Affairs. Uh, Townsend also decided to expand the number of vice admiralty courts. These were designed to try smugglers. In, in other words, he was trying to enforce the collection of these customs duties. Now, another controversial action taken by Charles Townsend was uh, involved uh, a bill that had been passed by Parliament some years earlier. In 1765, uh, Parliament passed the Quartering Act, and what this act did was to say that the colonial towns had to pay for the upkeep of any soldiers that were stationed in their town. Now, in 1767, Charles Townsend decided to transfer soldiers from frontier posts uh, and transfer these soldiers to these towns. Now, this was a cost-saving measure for the British government because they didn't have to pay for the soldiers now that they were in town, while they would have to pay for them if they were in these uh, frontier posts off in the middle of nowhere. Now, these policies were very, very unpopular among the colonists. First of all, merchants in big port cities like Boston, Philadelphia, New York City, uh, they really resented having to pay these new customs duties because that cut into their profits. Um, the vice admiralty courts had always been unpopular, and expanding them made them, made them more unpopular because colonists, remember, believed that um, that it was a violation of their rights, that they were not entitled, they felt they were entitled to a trial by jury, by, by their peers, not by some judge appointed by the crown. And uh, the stationing of troops in towns was seen by the colonists as a violation of their rights as Englishmen. The, the English Bill of Rights, which we've discussed, the, the English Bill of Rights had said that uh, in times of peace, soldiers not, could not be quartered in people's homes. It was known as billeting. And, uh, the, the colonists felt that their rights were being violated because they were having to pay for these soldiers stationed in their homes. Now, eventually what happened is that all this resentment boiled over in the famous Boston riot of uh, 1768. Now, you've got to remember that the Townsend Acts were particularly unpopular in a port city like Boston, that this whole 
economy was based on trade. And so local merchants were not very happy. Um, what local merchants did in Boston and other ports was to organize a boycott of English imports to protest these new taxes. And uh, these local efforts to boycott English goods were called non-importation agreements. In other words, they tried to get all the local merchants not to buy English goods. Now, the, the Sons of Liberty were very important in um, basically enforcing these non-importation agreements. For, for example, if, uh, if a merchant was found selling English goods, he might find his store, his windows broken, or he might be burned in effigy, or he might be assaulted by the Sons of Liberty. So they used the, the threat of force and force to keep this, these non-importation agreements in effect. Now, in, eight, in 1768, uh, these, all these events came to a head when there was a public town meeting in Boston, and Samuel Adams was there. Now, Samuel Adams was a, a prominent leader of the Sons of Liberty, and, that he, and he proposed that the Massachusetts legislature draft a letter and send this letter to all the other colonial legislatures, and basically the gist of this letter was to be said that the the Revenue Act of 1768 was taxation without representation. It was a new tax that had not been approved by, by the local legislatures and therefore was unconstitutional. It wasn't simply a matter of regulating trade. Now, the Massachusetts legislature um, agreed to this, and uh, the Massachusetts legislature actually had a vote, and the vote was unanimous, 92 to 17. The Massachusetts legislature, legislature voted to uh, to issue this letter and send it out to the other colonial legislatures. Now at this point, the new Secretary of State for American Affairs, he demanded uh, that this letter be withdrawn and he ordered the Massachusetts governor to dissolve the Massachusetts legislature, which the governor was entitled to do. So this was the time when there was, everybody was on edge, everybody was nervous, and it was at this point that British officials in Boston decided to seize the merchant ship known as the Liberty, and on the charges that uh, this boat was engaged in smuggling. Now, this ship belonged to just no ordinary merchant. It belonged to a man by the name of John Hancock. Now, he was the, the wealthiest merchant in all of Boston, and he was a leader of the Sons of Liberty and a well-known critic of the British government. So, it was, it was generally believed that the British officials had seized this boat because they wanted to send a message. They were finding, trying to find a way to target uh, John Hancock and bring him to justice and get him in trouble. So when news spread in Boston that this, the liberty had been seized, there was a huge riot and a mob went onto the ship, they seized the cargo and they carried it off. They did that because by doing this they eliminated all the evidence there would have been that this ship was engaged in smuggling. Now when news crossed the Atlantic, about this incident, about this riot, and about how the mob had acted, the British Parliament was very angry, and they demanded action. In fact, uh, there were members of Parliament calling for the immediate arrest of both John Hancock on, and Samuel Adams, and bringing them back to Great Britain and to charge them with treason. Now, when news of this hit the colonies, there was a lot of outrage, because Many colonists believe that this would have been a violation of their rights as Englishmen, that they deserved a trial by a local jury, not by some parliament committee over across the Atlantic. And uh, the Virginia legislature decided to get into the action. They wanted to show solidarity with Massachusetts. So in 1769, Virginia, uh, the Virginia House of Burgesses, or legislature, passed a series of resolves into support of uh, Massachusetts. First of all, they, they echoed what the Massachusetts legislature had said. They said that Parliament had no authority to lay taxes on the colonists without their approval. And they also said that the British government had no right to try colonists overseas, that colonists should be tried by a local jury. Now, Virginia's legislature had a lot of clout. They're the oldest legislature in all the colonies. And other legislatures followed suit and passed similar resolves in agreement with what the colonial uh, uh, Virginia assembly had done. Now, all this events, the Boston riot, would lead directly to the next major event, the Boston Massacre. You see, uh, after the riot in 1768, the British government decided that they were going to station 4,000 troops in the city of Boston. 
Now, this created problems from the very beginning because there were 4,000 troops. Boston had a population of 15,000. So calling upon the people of Boston to pay for the upkeep of these soldiers was quite a burden to the people of Boston. Remember, the Quartering Act required them to pay for these soldiers. Um, so for a lot of the, the people of Boston, it was insulting to them that they had to pay for these soldiers who they felt were just there to oppress and watch over them, to kind of spy on them. Another problem was that these British soldiers were very low paid, so a lot of times they, they took jobs, whatever jobs they could, took, they, could, they could get, and a lot of times this took away jobs from young people and, and people who needed work living in Boston. Now all, these, all this resentment and anger all came to a head on a uh, March night, March 8, 1770. Now it started out as a bunch of kids throwing snowballs and rocks at the soldiers and calling them names. But pretty soon uh, there was a mob, a lot of people showed up and they began to throw rocks and other things at the soldiers. Turns out that some of the soldiers understandably got us scared and they fired into the mob and when it was all said and done, five people were dead, shot dead. Now, many of the colonists thought that this was a terrible, well, of course it was a terrible thing, but they, they solved it as, a, as an act of oppression by the British government. They referred to it as the, the Boston Massacre. And uh, colonists were just shocked. Uh, and, and news of the massacre went all over the colonies. Now, it turned out that some of the colonists themselves were not all happy about well, they were unhappy about the behavior of the colonists, that they had taken mob action. In fact, uh, John Adams, a prominent a spokesperson, a, a relative of Samuel Adams, he came forward and agreed to serve as the lawyer for the soldiers. The soldiers were charged with the murder. And the British government, they were a little upset by the whole actions as well, and they decided to allow these soldiers to be tried by a local jury. Now, Thanks to the efforts of John Adams, the, uh, the soldiers were able to get off on the, the uh, lesser charge of manslaughter, which meant they had their thumbs cut off, which you know, is better than execution, I suppose. Now, the, uh, after these events of 1770, the, the British government uh, be, be believed that maybe they needed to kind of take a breather. Now, by 1770, the, uh, the new minister uh, was no longer Townsend. The new chief minister of King George was a man by the name of Frederick North, or simply Lord North. And uh, he decided, that, first of all, to take, take the soldiers out of Boston and put, take them out of the city limits. The soldiers were still nearby. They were just taken out of the city limits. He also went to Parliament, and he asked Parliament to repeal the Hated Revenue Act of 1767. Now, he really believed strongly that the British government had the right to impose these taxes. They didn't want to give the colonists the impression that they agreed with the colonists, so they, they left the tax on tea intact, just to kind of send a message. They were saying, hey, we're going to give you a break, we're going to repeal this, these, these unpopular taxes, but we can still tax you, and we're going to have this tax on tea. Now, some historians believe that North uh, may have also been motivated to ask for this repeal is because uh, of the fact that the boycott had been so effective. I mean. If, if Americans weren't buying English goods, that hurt the British economy. So uh, it is believed that the, the, the boycott had been harmful, and uh, that was another factor uh, that got Lord North to, to repeal, get Parliament to repeal the Revenue Act. Now, the, the repeal of the Revenue Act of 1767, or at least part of it, that, that eased tensions a bit. But then, you've you still got to remember that the colonists were still paying all these other customs duties. And you had a really strong effort by the British government uh, to um, collect these customs duties. And uh, the British government was taking a real strong stand against smuggling. See, the colonists were trying to avoid paying these ta taxes by smuggling in goods. So the British government would send in ships, uh, warships, naval ships, to patrol the coasts and to catch smugglers. Now, these ships were very unpopular because, you know, the colonists didn't want to pay these taxes and they liked to smuggle. Well, anyway, what happened in 1772 was that a, a British schooner by the name of Gatsby, it was patrolling the coast of uh, Rhode Island and it, and it caught aground. And when it caught aground, a group of angry colonists, 
they boarded the ship, and they, they, they destroyed the ship. And they even wounded the captain of the ship in the process. Now, they didn't, hurt, they didn't kill anybody. They just destroyed the ship. Now, when news of this hit Parliament, there was a lot of anger. I mean, a lot of par members of Parliament considered this to be an act of treason. They had attacked a ship of His Majesty's Navy. And Parliament, I mean, Parliament was probably thinking these, 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 this mob was a bunch of terrorists, like using our, our lingo. So they were determined to take action. So, so they, they decided this, that a special commission needed to be sent and that whoever was responsible should be brought back to England and to stand trial in England on the charge of treason. Now, at the same time as this was going on, another thing happened that was very disturbing to the people of Massachusetts. The governor at the time was a man by the name of Thomas Hutchinson, and he was actually a native of uh, Boston. And uh, he announced that from now on, he would collect his salary directly from the collection of customs duties. And he would no longer receive his salary from the colonial legislature. Now, this move was very disturbing because, remember, the legislature's power to give the governor his salary was one of the ways that the legislature had power and influence. You take away that ability, and now the governors can act more independently of the legislature. So, this move by Hutchinson was seen as a direct threat to the autonomy and self-government uh, of the colony of, of, Massa um, of Massachusetts. So, and also, the fact that Parliament um, had declared that these colonists were going to be stead, stand trial in England, this also was considered by the, Engl the people of Massachusetts as a violation of their rights of Englishmen, a right to a trial by jury. Now, as at this point, that uh, it was very important to happen that, uh, that John Samuel Adams, um, Samuel Adams, uh, at, a, at a meeting, proposed um, the creation of a committee of, or committees of correspondence. Now, he, he was at this town meeting, and uh, the purpose of this committees of correspondence would be uh, to gather information and send out information to other colonies. Now, you've got to remember that back then they didn't have texts, they didn't have phones, they didn't have the internet, and so communication was difficult. But, what the, but by creating of the committees of correspondence, what this did was it created a mechanism for news about what was going on in one colony uh, could be uh, transferred to other colonies. So it was a way for all the colonies to communicate with one another. And um, the, in 1773, the Virginia House of Burgesses when they heard about this idea of a committee of correspondence, they decided to follow the example of Massachusetts and create their own committee of correspondence. So now you had one in Massachusetts, you had one in Virginia, the two of the oldest colonies, and all the other colonies followed suit. So by the end of 1773, you had a situation where all the colonies could share information and, and report to each other on where they believed that the, the British government was violating their rights. And it's, it's not an accident that within three years of their creation, uh, the colonies in Great Britain would be at war. Uh, in the next lesson, we'll be looking at the series of events uh, from 1773 to 1775 that would lead to the outbreak of war between Great Britain and